Hello, I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from ACS Spring 2021. We're joined today by Dr. Francesca Curtin and Michaela Wheeler from the Memorial University of Newfoundland. They're studying how to make cleaner, greener plastics from waste fish parts. Dr. Curtin? Hi. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all uh, today. And uh, as the introduction said, we're interested in making uh, plastics from fishery and aquaculture waste. How this came about is that where we live, as you can tell from the background of uh, my shot, is very close to the ocean and we have a large fishing and aquaculture industry. And in fact, the aquaculture industry is growing year on year. So I started having conversations with the local Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Association. And they said they were concerned about uh, increased waste production with this expansion of aquaculture. So one of my colleagues in engineering at Memorial University, Kelly Horvolt, developed a way to separate the uh, fish oil from the waste produced. So this is the guts, bones, skins, and so on. And this was a relatively simple process, but unfortunately the uh, produced fish oil wasn't suitable for nutraceutical or nutritional supplement purposes. And so we were chatting and I have an interest in uh, kind of green polymers. And I thought, well, maybe we could make a plastic from this material and maybe it would be degradable. So um, we uh, looked at the literature and uh, developed a three step method for making a plastic from the oil. And so you can see the uh, fish oil has a yellow color um, on the screen. And in three steps, we produce a uh, a film-like material with an orange-red colour. And it's slightly stretchy as shown in the video. So in the first step, we use hydrogen peroxide, and this is the same material that you can buy in a uh, drugstore or pharmacy. And this oxidises the fish oil. And then we react it with uh, carbon dioxide, and then we react it with an amine. And an amine is a nitrogen-containing molecule. And we um, were looking at the different amines that could be used. And we thought, well, if we use a amine from a biological source, we could um, maybe uh, make the process even more sustainable. So we started with an amine that can be obtained from cashew nutshell waste. And this is a commercially available um, material. And uh, we got the uh, red orange plastic um, shown. And then uh, this is where Michaeli, who's also on this press conference today, um, came into the project. She decided to screen some other amines and her research focused on looking at the reactivity of amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And several of these worked really well, including asparaginine. And her poster at the uh, ACS meeting talks about her research. So next slide, please. In addition to looking at making the plastics, Michaeli also looked at uh, whether, you know, our hypothesis that these might be more degradable would hold true. And so um, our initial studies in this area, we used uh, an electron microscope to look at the surface of the plastics under certain conditions. So we um, had the untreated polymer that's on the top left there, and you can see it's a relatively smooth surface. And if we put these uh, plastics into water, they swell by about 10% mass or even volume. And we start to see holes appearing on the uh, surface, as you can see in the uh, bottom picture. And if we add an enzyme, a lipase, a biological catalyst to the uh, water solution, we dramatically accelerate the degradation process and we see um, both large and small cracks on the surface. And also we start to see microbes growing on the surface. So on the picture on the right, you can see some long thread like structures and these are the um, fungi that are growing on the surface. And you can also see smaller um, spherical circular um, objects on the surface and uh, these are bacteria. So um, 
our hypothesis held true that the material does appear to be uh, more degradable. And we're excited about the opportunities that are available in this area and for these materials. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Curtin. <clears throat> Very interesting. Are there any questions from viewers? Please state your name and affiliation in the chat window when you ask your question. Um, while we wait for questions from viewers, I will start with a few of my own. So you mentioned uh, fish oil supplements. Do fish oil supplements also come from the same fish waste that you're using? And if so, would this method compete with that market? So uh, my understanding for the fish oil supplements that uh, they're processed in a very different way and in a kind of more high tech setting um, that things have to be kept very clean and hygienic. And so um, for a lot of locations around the world where there's a fishing industry, um, they don't have the funding to put in place the facilities that are needed to produce um, the fish oil supplements. And um, what we've uh, what we envisage happening um, here in particular is that we'll have centralized sites to process this fish waste. But the problem with this is that um, the fish oil starts to degrade. So the oil is a fat. And so just like butter, if you leave butter out on the side, it starts to smell and go rancid. That's what happens with the fish oil. And if you want to use it as a supplement, you need to stop that happening. And that takes a lot of time, effort and money. Whereas for the, the plastics that we're making, um, in, in fact, it might help in the process if they're already a little bit pre-oxidized because our first step is oxidation. Great, okay. And how much fish is needed to make polyurethane? Hmm. So, um, we were we were talking about this the other day, weren't we, Michaeli? How how much um, plastic is how is produced from how much oil? And so, if you had um, one gram of oil, you would produce about uh, one point three to one point four grams of plastic. It really depends on the nature of the amine you're using. So, the larger the size or the higher the mass of the amine, the uh, the less fish oil you need in the polyurethane. And the, the fish, when they're um, caught, it's between 40 and 60% of the mass of the fish goes to waste. So the, the fish head and the bone, um, the fish has put in a lot of energy to, to grow those parts, but it's not something that's sold as a food product in most areas of the world. And so it's really useful to do something um, with that material. Definitely. And is there enough fish waste in the world to satisfy the demand for polyurethane? So um, we did some calculations uh, once when we were working on a proposal in this area. And uh, based on uh, United Nations figures uh, for how much fish is both wild caught and uh, through aquaculture around the world, and based on uh, average amounts of um, waste from fisheries, um, there's plenty of this oil that could be accessed and used to make materials, whether it's these polyurethanes or not. And so we, we did the calculation and the, the masses matched up really well with um, linseed oil and castor oil, which are oils obtained from non-food crops. Good. All right. Uh, how do you extract, actually extract the oil from the fish bones, skins and remains? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can answer this one, actually. So uh, we don't actually do it ourselves, but our uh, engineering collaborators do it. They take the fish waste and basically they put it in a giant fish uh, or food processor, pretty much, and just put it all, mix it together, make a giant mixture. And so when you get that mixture, you can take it and then you can centrifuge it. And just like uh, your cooking oil floats on top of water, the fish oil floats on top of the rest of the mixture and you can just separate it from there. I see, okay. And what type of fish will work for this process? Um, basically any fish that's what you would term in terms of dietary needs an oily fish. So um, we've used primarily um, salmon um, fish oil, but also we've used um, herring and capelin oil. And uh, a student also, they bought some cod 
liver oil supplements and open them up and use the the cod liver oil as well and uh, all of them so far have uh, been able to to make the plastics we just haven't had time to scale this up or um, look at their properties in a lot of detail yet but we know the the chemistry works how long does the fish oil based polyurethane <clears throat> excuse me persist before degrading so in the presence of the enzyme uh, within a week we start to see all these uh, cracks and uh, the growth of microbes on the surface however when it's in a dry environment when we have the film when we start store that in the bench in small glass vials um, we don't see any sign of uh, degradation when we put it into water um, without the enzyme for about a week, it just kind of swells up, but we do still start to see um, um, bacteria and, uh, and fungi growing on the surface if you leave it much longer than that in water. So these uh, new um, polyurethanes, they wouldn't be um, suitable for use in very wet environments where uh, they would swell up because we kind of think that the holes that we showed on the microscope images, um, that's kind of how the, uh, the fungi and uh, bacteria are getting in there to uh, start to digest the, uh, the plastic. Okay, and we have a question from a viewer. Uh, this is from Sarah from Urethane Technology International. Uh, she asks, what practical application do you think this type of polyurethane might have? So um, thank you for the question. We're still um, in the process of fully characterizing uh, the mechanical properties and uh, other features of these uh, plastics. Um, when I was talking with um, a colleague, they were suggesting that the, the red color that uh, came about through use of this cashew nutshell um, L amine meant that maybe they would be good at in, in applications where you needed a filter for different light tones and colors. Um, we, uh, we're quite interested to see if they, they even though you know, they're, they're not 100% compatible with moisture. We're, we're interested in seeing if they could be used in any uh, food packaging applications or even in uh, making uh, wound dressings or coverings. Uh, but there's so much that would need to be studied if you want to go into those areas in terms of toxicology and uh, safety. But uh, yeah, no, I had a, had a message from somebody in the run up to this who's interested in polyurethanes for absorbing oil from seawater. And so uh, it'd be interesting to see if they could be used in that sort of area as well. Definitely. So there are other biodegradable plastics made from corn and soy products. Is this one comparably degradable? So um, as what we know of the related materials that are made from soybean oil, um, our materials show similar properties. So both in terms of degradation and potential applications, that would be where we would look. Um, we found that uh, while we were doing the degradation studies, we performed similar experiments with uh, polylactide or polylactic acid and also uh, polycaprolactone that are two degradable uh, polyesters. And we found that this uh, NIPU, this polyurethane material, was more degradable than uh, the uh, polylactide, um, but less degradable than the polycaprolactone. And you mentioned some possible applications. Have you created anything out of the fish oil polyurethane for real world applications yet? So not yet. So we, we generally um, make, being chemists, we make things on a fairly uh, small scale in our, in our lab. We're doing very exploratory um, research. So the largest piece of uh, polyurethane that we've made is probably a, a film of, um, you know, two or three centimeters uh, uh, square. Um, and uh, we haven't actually tried to um, use them in a um, specific application yet, but we'd be um, excited to, you know, share our technology with others out there who um, have great ideas for applications. Okay. Um, so how long would it take the plastic to degrade if it's just, you know, left in air out on a table, for instance? Um, 
I, I think you normally put it in water and add enzyme, but how, how would it degrade just, you know, even out in the environment? I, you know, I, we haven't done those experiments yet, but I feel that it would degrade eventually over time, particularly if it was uh, outside in a more weathered atmosphere, particularly in, in where we live, where there's a, a lot of rain and uh, moisture in the climate. And um, so um, I would imagine that, uh, you know, we'd start to see significant degradation within a, a few months, but and maybe after a year it would disappear. But um, I would have to look in the literature to see what had been done with the soy, soybean based materials and also to compare with the caprolactone and the polylactide because we know it's um, much more degradable than the polylactide. Okay. So it sounds like um, water greatly accelerates the, the process. Yeah. If you were to just use the plastic in your home without exposure to the elements, would mm. it be expected to last you know, a lot longer? I, I think it should last for a while. And uh, I think there are ways that we could um, sort of demonstrate a lifetime uh, of these materials in an everyday household setting uh, through accelerated aging and that sort of thing. And uh, of course, uh, you know, microbes, you know, as living organisms need water to uh, reproduce and live. And so uh, if we're preventing um, significant volumes of water, the material, I imagine, shouldn't degrade. Uh, how does the chemical structure of this fish oil based polyurethane vary from that of petroleum based polyurethane? So um, a lot of petroleum-based polyurethanes have um, lots of aromatic um, groups um, in the backbone, so um, benzene rings. And this gives them a certain amount of um, rigidity that uh, our material just wouldn't have because of the nature of the building blocks um, used. And so I think compared to some polyurethanes, our uh, materials will be um, less hard or tough, but at the same time, um, more um, stretchable and able to, um, you know, be a little bit like um, a saran wrap or uh, other uh, uh, films that are used for uh, wrapping across um, a surface. Okay. And as far as the, the chemical structure, what about it makes um, this polyurethane degrade faster mm -hmm. than conventional polyurethane? So the, the lipids, the fish oil that we're using as a building block, it contains esters. And uh, for, for anybody interested in degradable polymers, the ester group um, is fantastic for um, encouraging uh, biodegradation because uh, they're very easy to do a reaction called hydrolysis, which is a reaction with water. And so this starts to break apart um, carbon oxygen and carbon carbon bonds in the structure. And uh, in our case, the um, hopefully the material would break down back into um, something similar to the fish oil. So what we would call probably fatty acids and things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. And have you tested the breakdown of the new material to see which compounds are released? So um, this was one of the challenges brought about by COVID. So we were at the stage of where we were going to start analyzing uh, the solutions with uh, one of my analytical chemistry uh, colleagues, both for uh, total dissolved organic content in the solutions, but also to identify what the degradation uh, products were. So those experiments are still ongoing at the moment. Okay. Um, Michaeli, I'll address this question, question to you. Um, are the mechanical properties of fish oil based polyurethane the same as those of the petroleum based plastic? And um, as far as applications, which kind of applications would overlap? You mentioned nothing in water, you know, water applications would be bad, but um, are there others that are, are similar between the two? Well, we haven't done any mechanical testing as of yet. That is still something we need to do. So I'm not really sure about um, that aspect. But as for the applications, um, one, I think another application that might overlap is um, we can use it in, we might be able to use it in clothing because petroleum um, poly based polyurethanes are used in like um, weatherproof clothing. I know that is, um, there is some water involved in that that might cause some issues, but 
it is a possibility. Okay, very good. And related to that, what if someone has a fish allergy? Um, could they still use this type of polyurethane in clothing, for example? Um, I think Fran was saying to me earlier that the fish, the part of the fish oil that causes the allergies is the proteins, I believe, Fran, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. So we are, you, the polyurethanes are made from the lipid part of the uh, fish oil. So the protein, the allergies might not be an issue, but it's something we need to definitely test in the future. Okay, great. All right. And either of you can answer this question. What are the next steps for the research? So, yeah, we, we really want to identify with the biodegradation uh, what, what we're producing because we don't want to think that we're producing something that's not harmful to the environment and then it not be very good. So we do, we do need to look in the forward direction there. But uh, clearly we need to um, get those mechanical properties because the mechanical properties of the polymer will determine um, what applications it can be uh, used in. And... Uh, we, uh, we've had a few people get in touch since we published our work, our initial work in this area, and uh, they've been uh, suggesting different areas where the materials could be useful. So uh, we're looking forward to establishing some collaborations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you have any kind of timeline for when this could possibly be commercialized or is it still pretty far down the road? So I work with a uh, part of our university, it's called the Marine Institute, and uh, they've got a kind of bioprocessing lab there. And what they've been uh, looking into with me and with the aquaculture industry is the viability to set up some of these uh, processing centers. So sort of a bit like a blue biorefinery where we could bring all the waste from numerous fish plants to one location and then process it into different fractions, including the uh, fish oil. So um, they've been doing some economic analysis to figure out what's viable or not viable uh, and good locations for these. And so um, I'm hoping that these colleagues of mine at the Marine Institute can uh, convince our uh, provincial or state government to um, help uh, build sort of a pilot plant. And, uh, and so we'd be able to access more um, material and perhaps scale up the production of these plastics so that then maybe we'd be able to give samples to different people for testing and uh, use. So I think we're looking um, maybe um, with the, the funding situation, maybe two to three years to maybe have sort of pilot plants. And then if, if that's successful, maybe, you know, five years or so to actually have product on the market. All right. We will keep an eye out for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so my final question, what take home message about this research would you like to leave with viewers? I think there's a, a lot of negativity out there surrounding um, plastics. And I just like to say that not all plastics are bad. They're really useful in many um, applications and they can make our life better. But I think as uh, scientists, it's good to take some responsibility and plan for the future. And uh, we're just excited that uh, something that we wrote down on paper a couple of years ago as an idea um, actually came to fruition. We were able to make these plastics and they show really promising degradation properties. All right, Michaela, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, Fran pretty much summed it up. We just, we are able to make a plastic fully biosourced, which makes it completely better for the environment. So it just comes full circle. Very good. All right, thank you both. Um, the archived version of this session will soon be posted at www.acs.org slash ACS Spring 2021 conferences. Please join us for our next press conference tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thank you.